Welcome back. As it is time for another edition of Over Under here on Mountaineer Report, brought to you by WV Sports Now. I am Mike Osti. That is Ethan Bach. We went over under for some individual players and what they were going to do, what we thought maybe they were going to do on the offensive side of the ball. Garrett Green, Jaheim White, all the way to Day Day Farmer and how many TDs he will catch as a rookie sensation that many believe he can be around the program. And we are now going to do the same thing on the defensive side of the ball, maybe even get into some team categories because the defense, 66th overall in the nation last year, probably needs to be better, but deeper, and they believe they're going to be better, and that was obviously way better than the year before. So before we get to the basketball news at the end of this show, we are going to play this over-under. So, Ethan, to start things off, the man that's been talking a lot, I should almost add an over-under two sound bites that go viral this season. But aside from viral sound bites, Garnet Hollis, who they ended up bringing in from Northwestern, another Big Ten transfer like Beanie Bishop a year ago. He's flapping his gums about Penn State, hating Penn State, all of that. But he's brought in to kind of be the new Beanie Bishop. Beanie Bishop helped recruit him. He wants to follow Beanie's path. He wants to go to the NFL. He believes he can show more. He wants to do more at an actual legit major college program. He feels like he's kind of been overshadowed when he was at Northwestern over under four interceptions for Garnet Hollis. And the number four is there because that's exactly what Beanie Bishop put together last year when he was a consensus all American. He did a lot more as well. The ball Hawk rate was there. Brown said he should have had even more picks, but he ended up with four. Does Garnet do better than that? Yeah. So West Virginia has found this recipe uh, with being Bishop that they're trying to replicate this year, a big 10 uh, defensive back uh, this time from Northwestern instead of Minnesota. Um, But I'm going to go the under on the interceptions on four. Um, It's going to be really hard to replicate uh, an all American season that Beanie Bishop had. So I'm going to go right under, right, right under the under. Okay, you three is what you're thinking he's going to put together. Is that what you're saying? Two or three, yeah. Okay. Yeah, four is is a good amount of picks. Now, Beanie was not vying for the Thorpe Award and those individual awards, and he probably would have been if he was at five, six, seven picks. At one point, he was right up there at top in the nation, but then kind of fell off. And, of course, he had a couple in an individual game, uh, a big one, obviously, in in the brawl against – Phil Jerkovic and then dropped one of his viral sound bites. So to be funny off of what he said recently, Ethan over under one and a half viral sound bites that single-handedly churns media content for, for Garnet Hollis this year. He really already had one. We haven't even started the season, but from week one, I was going to say he's off to a hot start. Uh, (laughs) I think that if he's, if if, uh, we're heading with the trajectory of, uh, where we're at right now, preseason, yeah. I, that's that we're going to have to hammer the over, uh, <laughs> especially when you have Penn State, Pitt. Uh, you got some quality Big 12 teams mixed in there, too. If they start, if they lose one game, uh, I could see I could see him saying that they'll be back and yeah. they're going to bounce back. So, uh, yeah, off of off of just this month alone, uh, I'm going to have to hit hit the over on one and a half. And I really hope one of those picks is against Penn State or Pitt, one of those rivalry games, because that's really the only way, if you're a non-QB, you're going to get to talk to this player, win or lose. I definitely want to be talking to Carnot Hollis like we did Beanie Bishop. We didn't know we were going to get that soundbite from Beanie Bishop of the, yeah, I, you know, we watched the film. We realized he wasn't good at his job. And we're sitting there, wow, he really said that. And Garnet Hollis, I just simply asked him, hey, you know, any other perspective about Penn State because you're in the Big Ten, just – Ho hum, and he went on a five minute rant about <laughs> how Penn State doesn't respect anybody and how he hates them and wants to steal their soul. I believe so. He he really I think hates Penn State more than anyone who's a West Virginia fan or, or on the Mountaineers. You have to figure it's the over, but I guess the only counter would be Ethan if they would lose these rivalry games or if he doesn't get a pick, even if they win, because it's hard to figure how many interceptions they're going to get. Those are off of luck as well. Maybe he wouldn't get an opportunity to give a soundbite. Maybe the coaching staff has kind of told him, hey, we're going to need to keep it tight lip prior to the game. They probably didn't like what just happened. So maybe he wouldn't be brought to us, as you know how this works. Maybe we're not going to get to talk to this man. I probably certainly won't anymore. Um, maybe we wouldn't get him after games. 
we might be having things work against us trying to get viral sound bites now of Garnet Hollis. But I, if he's there, if he's willing to talk and able to talk, then I think we're definitely hammering the over there. Uh, again, Mountaineer Report is we're going over under for some defensive players after already doing the offensive side of the ball, which is available on YouTube. So like and subscribe over there and also everywhere you get your podcasts. Aiden Garns is kind of the underrated secondary transfer. He's from an FCS at Duquesne. They played him last year. He played well in that game. He didn't come from the Big Ten. He's not getting the flash of Garnet Hollis, but he's talked a lot. The coaches have been raving about him. He did play well against the Mountaineers last year, which is part of what led him to coming to West Virginia. Part of his recruitment, he picked up a view over Cincinnati, partly because he already experienced Mountaineers in that game against WVU. It's an FCS to a major conference. It's hard to gauge this. I'm just going to throw out over under 20 tackles on him. It depends on how much playing time he really gets. Maybe it depends on what Jaheim Joseph does, the other Northwestern transfer, because the coaches are not as high on him. But if they like Aiden Garns as much as they're saying they like Aiden Garns, it's probably hammering the over. That's probably undershooting him. But that's where I'm at right now. Yeah, the way the way this coaching staff's been talking about Aiden Garns, yeah. um, you, you would have to hammer the over twenty tackles. Uh, it seems like he's going to get a lot of uh, opportunities, or I guess more opportunities than uh, than you would expect from an FCS to FBS transfer. Right. Um, so yeah, I I think right now, just before the games begin, and we can actually evaluate and see how much Aiden Gardens is going to play and how many reps he's getting. I, I, you have to hit the over 20 tackles. And I was meaning overall to make this clear because he had 20 solo tackles last year at Duquesne and then 50 overall. He had 28 overall, though, the prior year at Duquesne. So it depends on what Aiden Gardens are getting. And I certainly took him down a notch because he is going to the Big 12 from the FCS. But if the coaches give him the time that Ethan's talking about and they really do love him as much as they keep saying they do then it probably is is way under shooting him you probably hammer the over he had two interceptions last year and two the year before over under one and a half picks for Aiden Garns that's a tough one I know I, I didn't can, want to, I get can, to exactly again because we're yeah leagues. you made you made this one hard on me I could I see know. I could see uh I think I think gut says under um, okay. I, I think, I think with, with, uh, the opportunities that both Northwestern transfers are going to have, yeah. um, I, I could also see Aiden Gardens getting more reps than any of us expected. Yeah. Uh, yeah. but at the same time, I, I think, I think, uh, interceptions are going to be hard to come by for Garns this season. So I'll say the under a lot of it is opportunity. And he's more of a corner out there. So maybe he would have a chance. It's, at some because he's maybe going to be dealing with a lot of man to man, but how does he deal with that transition going from FCS to the big 12? They think they have a defense that's deeper and going to generate more turnovers. Certainly last year's generated more turnovers than the year before, but turnovers are always luck. I mean, how many are you really going to get? They basically won the brawl single-handedly off of the turnovers. Yeah, I, I probably would lean under two. I went one and a half. If it was just one, I, I probably would definitely I would definitely either push or go under, but one and a half makes you think. But yeah, I, I probably would go under as well. This is an interesting one, and we talked about him a lot on these Mountain Hill Report shows, Ethan. We've all, all of WVU media has been talking and writing about him, and that is Aubrey Burks. He's the PFF darling. He's the one that should be an NFL prospect no matter how this year goes but he has a little bit of a different position situation this year where he's going from a traditional cat safety to more of a hybrid safety linebacker spear type of thing. He had 39 solo tackles last year and 44 overall, but he did miss some time with an injury. He did suffer the serious incident at TCU. So that certainly is part of this the year before he got 66 I'm going to give him an over under of, and this is a different position now. It may generate more tackles and maybe less interceptions, possibly. I'm going to say over under 60 tackles for Aubrey Burks and then over under. Uh, 
one interception and two forced fumbles because he had one forced fumble and one pick last year. But I'm thinking he's going to have more opportunities at fumbles and maybe less at picks this year. Yeah, I, I'm, I would hit the over on tackles um, just based on the position that he's going to be playing more so this season. Yeah. Uh, but at the same time on the interceptions, I still feel like he can get over. I still feel like he can get two again like he did last season. Okay. Um, if he's if he's trying to uh, lure, lure the offense and uh, basically uh, try to fake the quarterback out and play deeper than uh, he anticipated, I think he can trick a couple passes right there. And that's just what that's just him playing strategically, not just moving around uh, yeah. uh, as a spear linebacker. So I think he gets I think he can get more than one interception still at that role. But at the same time, he will his tackles will increase. His tackles should definitely increase. I mean, even going to Ben Cutter last year as a freshman, he had 50. That was kind of a traditional linebacker. They weren't as deep last year at linebacker Reed Carrico. I'm going to set Reed Carrico's over under at 50 tackles as well. He pretty much had no stats at Ohio State. He's really, really hard to set over under for, but he's a major conference transfer. I think a lot of the coaches have called him more of a depth piece, though. Uh, they know more than me, and they're going to be the one employing him. Is he used like people thought when he was transferred from Ohio State? Is he not over under 50 tackles? It's where Ben Cutter was, but. This is somebody who was a four-star recruit out of high school. He maybe should be higher. Yeah, I think I think that over under also is difficult because yeah, um, like Ben Cutter had fifty-six tackles, but then at the same time, uh, it's 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 just a tough it's just a tough situation when the coaches are saying already that. <laughs> He's going to be a depth piece. So depth piece isn't a good term. I mean, it's no. not. They're not. They're trying not to insult. That's not a negative term, and it's not like he's looked bad at practice. But that's not a term you want to hear for a guy you think is going to be in, one of in the better August. players in right. August. Yeah. So I'm just based off of that. I'm I'm going to lean towards the under on fifty total tackles. Okay. Josiah Trotter, he is somebody that last year could have had a major impact. Suffered a serious injury, missed the whole season. The coaches almost guaranteed now, looking back, he would have had an impact on that year. He is going to have a chance and an impact on this season, for better or worse. He looks bigger, stronger than everybody else out there. He looks like he's played for years. He looks like a beast. Over under four sacks for Trotter. It's also, I'm trying to be fair, it's hard to send over under on a guy who doesn't have any stats because he hasn't played college football, but he looks ready to go right now. And he was around the program last year, even when he didn't play. Yeah, I think I think with Josiah Trotter, he's bound to have a great uh, first season or official full first season with West Virginia. Yeah. Um, I'm going to say the under on sacks, but at the same time, it doesn't mean I think he's going to have a disappointing or a down year uh, for what the coaching staff and what the fans are expecting now. I think he's, his stats are still going to look pretty. Uh, especially at his position, but I think uh, four sacks in his first full season would that would be incredible. So, yeah, uh, yeah. setting the bar high um, and deservedly so. But I think I think the rest of his stats will look pretty. But I don't I don't think he'll hit four sacks. I also think he's going to have an impact that is going to be off the stat sheet too. He he's going to have such an impact of being someone the other team's going to have to scheme against and be aware of. He might be able to catch people off guard early in the season, although Penn State should certainly be well aware of them because he was around their base and, and their recruiting base. It's hard. I, I, I almost want to go push her under two on the sacks. That's a higher number than people think. This isn't the NFL. This is a college season. You look at a guy like Lee Copa. That's really where he was, and he was the top kind of guy at that spot. For WVU, no, he's not a perennial NFL player like some believe Trotter will be because his family got there, of course. Certainly his dad had a great NFL career, and he has that lineage. But that's being fair to him. Maybe he'll get over and have a gigantic impact on this season, and it does make you wonder what would have been the case last year if you had him because that was the one position on the defense where there was really no depth and they had tons of injuries. Imagine if you had him on that D last year and that D was even better. 
Does that bump them into the Big 12 title game? Does that give them a win or two more? That's why people, again, are believing on this team being a, being a legit contender. Sean Martin over under 30 tackles. I believe he was around that neighborhood last year. A lot of these over-unders are similar to what they did a year ago. But again, there's supposed to be more depth. He's supposed to be better. And the coaches are all putting more on him this year. There's a belief for some, though, that he's kind of maxed out and he just is what he is. He had 15 solo. He had 27 last year, 34 the year before. So that would be basically his average. But is he better is a thing. Over under 30 tackles for Sean Martin. I'm going to go over. I think okay. I think this is this is an important year for Sean Martin to really uh, emphasize and establish himself as uh, just that main guy at the, D, at the defensive lineman uh, position. Uh, I think yeah. he's I think he's established that to a point, but this would really put him uh, just on another trajectory. Uh, he's I, I think he's going to hit over thirty tackles. He's able to do it two seasons ago, and last year he came just short. So uh, I think this will be a year where he gets back in at thirty and possibly over thirty five total as well. Yeah, 35 would be a career high. It'd be a great way to go out for him. Obviously, he's a leader of the D-line, even though he's a quiet guy. He's wearing number five now, which is an important number to the program. And him personally, a lot to play for, dedicating this season to, to a late friend of his from his high school days. So a lot on him, even though it's kind of been under the radar with so many other moving parts on this defense and for this team and so many storylines out there. He's probably been undercovered, which, Ethan, you maybe could argue that's good for him. Maybe he's going to kind of fly into the radar. He's not getting talked about as much as some of these other guys. So last year, he was kind of hyped up. And you could argue he underachieved, and it went under the radar because the team ended up winning nine, and no one cared that he was underachieving. But he had a worse year than the year before. That that shouldn't happen again. I'm going to go under, though, and I'm not being negative. I, I mean, that's right around his average. So I'm going to say 28, 29, and he's just right under, but he's still an integral part of that defense. I want to hit some team things before we wrap up and then touch on the new basketball news of the day or of the week, really. So the West Virginia defense allowed 4,950 yards last season. Sounds like a lot. Yeah, that's a lot. Uh, definitely need to be better this year. You would imagine, but they are going to face some teams that certainly can put up points even in the new look big 12 and even Penn state can put up points, even though maybe they're not going to throw a deep tons over under allowing 4,500 yards. So I'm going to give that to you, assuming the defense is better than last year because they all say it's going to be better. And they did bring in more transfers than they did the year before. They supposedly have more depth. It should be better. Is it? I'm gonna say I'm gonna say they hit the under on that, and that's not that's not me taking um, taking their their words of the defense is way better. I don't think it's gonna be that much better. But then you look at you look at last season. Penn State almost had 500 yards. Oklahoma had 644 yards. If just one of those games, yeah, uh, the defense that played a, a nice half. That's auto, that's that easily ticks ticks the forty nine fifty down to closer to forty six hundred forty seven hundred. So yeah. effing um, Ollie Gordon had one hundred and forty nine himself in yeah. the fourth quarter of the game. Yeah, so if exactly he to a hundred instead of one forty nine. Not only do they probably win the game, but that already chucks it down a little bit. And even <laughs> even a team even a team like Houston where they played terrible they those are worse games in that year. game. Yeah. They, yeah. So I think even though yeah. West Virginia will play good offenses, Oklahoma State, Arizona, um, just the K State, just in conference play alone, that's before even talking about Penn State. Right. Um, I, th I think I think they're they'll have a they won't have I don't think they'll have a team like Oklahoma hitting 644 yards against them. Yeah, so they aren't going to play the Sooners. Yeah, I just like think that. naturally that number will go down. It it should. I almost went over under 5,000, but I do think it's almost a guarantee they should be better defensively, at least in what they allow. They also want to allow a lot less against them on the board. But in terms of yards, that's a big deal because teams really were knocking on the door quite frequently. And obviously those 
those individual games you mentioned, certainly the Oklahoma game, the Houston game, even the end of the Oklahoma State game, they really heavily weighted this. I mean, just as you're talking, that that's like over 2,000 yards right there, those three games <laughs> um, combined. Yeah. So you got to figure. Now, they may have a pie in the sky. They want to be under 4,000. That might be a little unreasonable in this conference. So I, I think under – I definitely think under 5K, but I think even under 4,500. Now, what's probably more important, Ethan, is they allowed 380.8 yards a game. And that includes allowing the 600-plus to Oklahoma, almost 700, but also holding Pitt to basically next to nothing in the backyard brawl and winging that in a slugfest where Jerkovic couldn't move the ball and turn it over a bunch of times. Those two things existed. And that worked to the average of 380.8. Over under allowing 350 yards a game. I'm gonna I'm gonna still go over. I don't think I don't think this defense is as improved as okay. uh, the coaches are making it out to be. Yeah, uh, I think going into most seasons, the coaches would say the defense has improved. That's just like right, yeah. kind of like in college basketball, where you hit October and all of a sudden everybody can shoot threes uh, just right, off right, of right. one off season. So, right, right. Um, I I think I think the defense could be improved, but at the same time, they're playing a lot of good offenses that are way better than West Virginia's defense. Yeah. So I just I think that that average that yard average is still going to be over 350 i think so too and especially now that i'm looking at it so the overall defense was 66 last year which really isn't good especially for a good team that there was a nine win team if they would get under 350 i mean they would jump they would skyrocket into the top 30 top 25 because even the rest of the 66 to 51 they're all allowing 360 more now they can't get that 380 and have that be 400. I do think they probably are going to make that 380 better than it was last year. Like if it was over under 380, I think they'd be under that because you don't have the Oklahoma game. So right there, that should help your average. And you maybe still have a great defensive game against Pitt and some of those teams. But 350 is a bigger jump than it may look. So yeah, I think they're still going to be over that. Maybe it'll be around where it was last year. Maybe a lot of these numbers will be around where they were um, last year. It'll be interesting. A lot of pressure, a lot of conversation about Green, where he ranks, whether he's getting respected or not, whether the team should be in the preseason top 25 or not. A lot of that is being discussed right now, Ethan. And I almost feel like the defense is being overlooked and almost being undercovered nationally. Like the issue for this team, to me, they're going to score points whether Green's better than he was last year or not. Points are going to be on the board. This is not going to be a Jared Daggy three points a game type of thing. It's not. They're going to score points. The issue will be, does the defense play well enough that they can legitimately win a conference or not? The defense needs to be better for them to really get to that level, and the defense can hold this team back. That is a real thing that is not being discussed now, but when we get into week three – when we get into the more of the season, certainly into Big 12 play, the defense will start getting exposed for who they really are. And it could be better than I'm thinking they're going to be, or it could be that they're just the same, or they're maybe not as great because they are losing a consensus All-American, even though Garnet Hollis is still really good. We will see. But the, def the defense is a major question mark here. There's depth. They can deal with injuries better. But are they really better? And that could hold the team back if they're not. So... <laughs> that's a major talking point that we're, we're going to, we're going to see, and we're going to certainly see right away in week one, because Drew Allard seen this team. He knows how they're going to play. He's seen the coach and the play calling. You could argue Penn state should be better against West Virginia as well. That's another thing, Ethan, as you know, a lot of West Virginia fans, I'm sure you're hearing it too. Oh, well, West Virginia's going to be better because they've seen Penn State already. They already know Franklin in the plays. Like, okay, it works both ways. Doesn't that, yeah. <laughs> doesn't that work both ways? <laughs> yeah. I mean, Penn State should be better, too. They kind of have some film to watch as well, even though there are some, some differences a little bit. But this is basically the same Mountaineer team from a season ago. Now, before we end this show, the basketball program did jump into the news a little bit to disrupt the football team for maybe 20 minutes as they hired a director of operations. This is a younger 
person in that role that recently played that maybe some would think maybe kind of used to this role being somebody who hasn't played in a half decade uh, at least former guard out of drake your thoughts surprising move move makes sense does this mean anything does this role even mean anything because not every program has this role mean as much it is some of the least surprising news of the off season uh i think <laughs> Darren Dries, like it's early on, it's it's pretty obvious to figure out he likes his own type of guys, um, yeah. which is which every coach does. But with Darren, it's it's a lot of the Drake connections or a lot of the Midwest connections, and that he's built through his two decades of coaching so far. So yeah. uh, having having a guy that was a GA last year on his staff who played five seasons with him uh, under him at Drake. Yeah. Uh, Stur- Garrett Sturtz is going to come in and be a director of ops right away with West Virginia. That's, that's, uh, that's not, not a surprising move, but I think having a young guy, another young guy in there, um, he's helped out with off season player development before. I think that's important. So having another young person in that building really helps them. Um, because now, now you look at that coaching staff and it's, it's totally different totally different from uh the the, having the same staff under bob huggins and having uh familiar names under josh eilert for the one year now you look at that staff there's absolutely no west virginia or wvu connections (laughs) mixed in there and it's that's interesting and it makes sense as you said Darren DeVries is not trying to appease West virginia connections as much as making sure he has his guys he's the coach and you know that when you bring in an outsider, Darren DeVries didn't have any connections either. You're probably going to get a whole staff without connections because that's what he's used to. He hasn't been around West Virginia. He's been around all these other guys. You want him to be comfortable and have his guys. Like if you get, if you, if you're hiring Darren DeVries, you're getting the Darren DeVries package, which are all his boys. You got to expect most of them are coming. It'll be interesting what this does for recruiting. I mean, his title doesn't have recruiting in it, but as you kind of mentioned, a young, recently former player. That was what people wanted out of McCabe a year ago, that maybe he still could offer Gottlieb at at, at Green Bay and in the future, and people wanted him to stay around to West Virginia. It almost feels like this kind of similarly replaces that, where you had a recent young player that could be friends with recruits and connect with them on the same generational level where even Darren DeVries could not. Even... A butler could not because he was a decade plus removed. Shirts now can. I mean, he, he just finished playing. He's more just out of it. He's around the same age, maybe only a year or two older than than some of the current players, and maybe only two or three years older than some of the recruits possible. Does that vibe make sense to you? Does that kind of fit that? Yeah, hundred percent. Um, because now you have. A Garrett Sturts, you have a Nick Norton. You have, now you have two yeah, former man. great players on staff. Yeah. Uh, they're similar, similar in age with just connecting with this younger generation. I think Jordan McCade did a great job uh, with Josh Eilert's staff uh, with that. And I think that's kind of what Bob Huggins' staff uh, lacked for a few years yeah. there. Especially Larry Harrison's great, but he's not, he was not connecting with a 19 year old. Let's put it. Yeah. It, it's, it's, totally different now it even yeah. with the transfer portal nil era mm-hmm. um there needs to be a lot more transparency and to be able to be transparent you have to relate a lot to these guys um yeah. to keep their trust and all that so now they have two guys that are really young on the staff um while at the same time you still have your veteran coaches uh like a darren Dries, chester frazier uh cory barnett etc so uh, now I think they have a nice mixture of the two, and I think the problem of stressing about who's going to assist Darren Dries on on the staff in April that's that's long gone now. Yeah, at least now you know basically the team, you know the staff, you know the staff long term. These are guys, these are young guys that unless something really catastrophically happens, I would imagine you're going to be feeling the same staff vibe for years to come. This will probably be the core group, and you do have a mixture of young and old. Yeah, for Huggins for a while, it was basically all old. It was his boys that had been there forever. Even Eilert, who's not really an old man, he had been with Huggins forever, and he's still a generation older 
than the kids he was coaching or recruiting. And on Eilert's staff, it was a lot of youth that maybe the fans liked, but it was also the the wrong year to do it because you had Eilert with no head coaching experience. He needed that staff would have been perfect under Huggins, a Hall of Famer, who could have said, "You do this, you do this in this situation, you do this here," and let them all be be molded to be better in the future and learn under him. Eilert needed to learn too, so they they didn't have anyone to ask the question of, "Hey, what did you do when you were in this situation?" The past Eilert never was in that situation as a head coach. Darren DeVries now experience, is now an experienced coach. So is Chester Fraser, and a lot of these guys can relate to the, the current players and recruits. So I do think it's a perfect blend. The issue that you've been touching on and pounding the pavement on that everyone knows, the only issue that really exists still that could kind of ruin the year, it's a very small team. So we'll see if, <laughs> if that is a problem or not. There's really no depth big-wise. If that doesn't get rectified, that could be the problem. But outside of that, it seems like DeVries kind of hit everything he wanted to hit, staff and the rest, throughout this offseason. That'll do it for this edition of the show here. Once again, like and subscribe Mountaineer Report on YouTube. You can also find us everywhere you get your podcasts. That is Apple, Google Play, TuneIn, etc. You can also find our coverage at WV Sports Now. And that football season, it really, really is inching closer to kicking off. I think the anticipation is there. These over-under games are fun, but I was just saying to somebody in a meeting 20 minutes ago, eventually we got to stop the talking. And it's about time to figure all of this out. And that's what's going to happen here, August 31st and 1st, and then onward from there.